Hello ladies and gentlemen. Okay, today we're going to cover fossils and geologic time. Um, this is quite a large subject, so I highly recommend that you spend some time reading this section in your textbook. Our planet has existed for about four and a half billion years. That's billion with a B. The rocks of the crust preserve clues to the Earth's rich history, its changing features, and the development of life. One of the primary roles of a geologist is to locate, observe, and interpret these clues. By looking at the features of rocks and rock outcrops, geologists can infer events in the past. In their investigations, they assume that forces that acted upon the Earth's crust in the past are the same as those that are active today. This is called the principle of uniformity or uniformitarianism, and it was established by Charles Lyell. The law of superposition tells us that the rock layers on the bottom of an undisturbed rock face are usually the oldest. Lower layers must be in place before younger rocks can be deposited on top of them. So geologists can date the relative ages of the strata from bottom to top, oldest to youngest. The law of superposition does have exceptions. Various processes can cause younger layers to be below older layers. The thing to keep in mind is that rock is always older than the processes that change it. An extrusion is igneous rock that formed from lava at the surface of the crust. An extrusion must be younger than the strata below it, but older than any layers above it. Intrusion, intrusions are caused when molten rock is injected into older rock layers in the crust. It cools and crystallizes to form igneous rock. Intrusions are younger than all of the rock layers in contact with them. Folds are bends in the rock strata. Sometimes folding can overturn rock strata so that older rock lies on top of younger rock. Folds, faults are cracks in the rock strata along which there has been movement. Faults produce offset layers, and rock strata must be older than the folds and faults that have changed them. Fossils are any naturally preserved remains or impressions of living things. They are generally found in sedimentary rock because the metamorphic and igneous rocks are formed under intense pressure at extremely high temperatures that would deform or destroy any fossils. Occasionally, whole organisms have been found preserved in the earth. Insects encased in amber or tree sap, animals that have fallen into tar pits, and ice age mammoths that have been frozen or encased in mud are all fossils that have been almost totally preserved. In fact, some mammoths used to be used as a food source by people in Siberia. More often, though, only the hard parts like bones, teeth, and shells are preserved. Some limestone formations are composed almost entirely of whole and broken marine shells. Because of their hardness, the bones and teeth are the most common remains preserved of higher animals. If the hard parts have been replaced by minerals washed in by groundwater, they are said to be petrified. An impression in mud can be preserved as a mold, and the material filling it becomes a cast that duplicates the shape of the organism forming it. Dinosaur footprints have been found in many locations. Even the fossilized excretions of anima animals called corporalites have helped scientists understand the eating habits of extinct animals. This, by the way, is not a corporalite. It's a petrified coral. Fossils also give us information about the ancient environment in which the organisms that formed them lived. For example, coral grows only in warm tropical waters. So if you found fossilized coral, you'd know that at least some point there was a warm tropical um, marine environment there. Fossilized woolly mammoths would indicate a cold continental environment, for example. This is an example of a fossil fish that is found in Wyoming, which means that Wyoming was covered by a small inland sea. This is related to the herring group. A way to determine relative age of rock strata is to look for things called index fossils. The best index fossils are those organisms that existed for a very brief geologic time, 20 million years or less, and were found over a large portion of the Earth. 
In a rock outcrop, a layer with index fossils would not extend very far vertically, but it would be found spread widely throughout the relatively thin layer of rock. It may be likely that in millions of years from now, humans would be an excellent index fossil. Modern humans have existed for only two million years, and our remains can be found worldwide. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, geologists in Europe noticed that rock formations could often be identified by the fossils they contained. They also found that certain formations were consistently located above or below other formations. From these observations, they established a relative time scale with a sequence of fossil groups from oldest to youngest. Each of these groups was named for a location where its characteristics fossils could be observed in the rocks, often the first place they found it. For example, fossils characteristic of Devon in England were named Devonian. We also have Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, etc. Over the years, further observations from around the world established a geologic time scale based on rock formations containing these characteristic fossil groups. The scale is divided into eras, periods, and epochs. You will need to know the difference between each kind of thing. The most recent portion of most depictions of the geologic time scale has been expanded to reflect more recent geologic events in greater detail. Though fossil evidence, geologists established a relative time scale with an inferred order of events. However, measurements of natural radioactivity in the rocks have allowed the geologic time scale to become an absolute time scale, one that gives absolute age of an object measured in years. Chemical elements often have several forms, called isotopes, that differ in the number of neutrons found in the atomic nuclei. For example, carbon-12 has six protons and six neutrons in its nucleus, whereas carbon-14 has six protons and eight neutrons in its nucleus. If the nucleus of an isotope has more or fewer than the normal number of neutrons, the isotope may be radioactive, and carbon-14 is. A radioactive isotope, or also known as a radioisotope, will break down naturally into a lighter element called a decay product. In this process, it gives off radioactivity. For example, the radioisotope carbon-14 will decay into a stable decay product, nitrogen-14, and release radioactivity as the decay occurs. Atoms, however, decay at a random and we can at random, and we cannot predict when a single individual atom will decay. The rate of decay of a radioactive element is measured by its half-life. Different radioactive elements have different half-lives. A half-life is the time required for half of an element's atoms in a sample to change to the decay product. In each succeeding half-life, half of the remaining atoms decay no matter how large the sample. As the element decays, fewer radioactive atoms remain in the sample, and more and more decay products accumulate. The higher the ratio of decay product to the radioactive element, the older the sample is. Laboratory studies have shown that the half-life for each element is not affected by environmental conditions such as temperature, pressure, or chemical combinations. Thus, when a geologist estimates the age of a particular sample, Using the radioisotopes, he or she can be confident that conditions within the Earth have not caused an error, which leads us back to the geological uniformity principle. Okay, that concludes fossils and geologic time. We will move on into meteorology and start moving away from the earthbound stuff and into the more um, fluid elements that we talk about in earth science. Thanks and have a great day.